installment of AI for Lamb. Ko Sydney Shep ta ko inua, he kai fakaheri o Waitiata Press, te farita o Waitiata, o te Heranawaka, Victoria University of Wellington, Wellington Aotearoa. I thought we'd start out with uh, a welcome, a greeting, and a karakia. So, fakataka te hau ki te uru, fakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia makahina kina ki uta, kia mataratara ki tai. E hiake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hahunga, hau mie, huye, tai kie. That's a greeting that, given the weather we've been having over on this side of the Tasman with cyclones and, uh, and torrential rain, thunders and storms, it says, get ready for the westerly and be prepared for the southerly. It will be icy cold inland and icy cold on the shore. The scarlet dawn rises over ice, snow and frost. Let us face it together. So around the warm campfire of AI for Lamb, welcome one and all. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Kia ora. And I would like to back that up, Sydney from Australia, Womanjika, everybody. I'd like to acknowledge the people of the Woiwurrung and Boomerang language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on where I sit today. I respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to acknowledge the custodians on where everybody sits today and welcome you all. Now, thank you very much. This session is being recorded uh, for the benefit of everybody that couldn't make it today. We've had a bumper attendance, so it's great to have you all here. Uh, and also I invite you all to use the chat function to introduce yourselves and your interest in the topic for today and ask any questions. Today's session will be split into two halves. First, all of our speakers today are from RMIT University, but the first half we actually have a number of esteemed speakers from RMIT University uh, and talking about the chapter that they're working, a book chapter that they're working on together. And I'll tell you a little bit about their background. But the second half of the session is actually one of uh, RMIT University's PhD candidates, Paul White, who will speak uh, for 10 minutes and will take all questions at the end for all of our speakers today. So to introduce Professor Falk Scholler, who's in the Information Access and Retrieval in the Data Science Discipline at RMIT University. And his research focuses on understanding how tools such as search engines and recommender systems uh, can assist users. And his interests include fairness, accountability, transparency, and ethics of systems and algorithms as part of the ARC Center of Excellence in Automated Decision-Making and Society. Folk is the Deputy Chair of the RMIT Human Research Ethics Committee and the Deputy Director of the RMIT Center for Information Discovery and Data Analytics. Secondly, we have uh, Dr. David Blades who, who, Blades, who is the Senior Coordinator of Research Integrity and Governance at RMIT and a subject matter expert in his responsible research conduct. He has previous experience in human research ethics, and he has published on the topic of the United States nuclear weapons testing. We have Associate Professor Marsha Berry here from the School of Media and Communication, where she teaches creative practice research methods and is the chair of the Design and Social Context Human Ethics Advisory Network. She is author of Creating with Smartphones and is co-editor of two volumes on mobile media. And for Dr. Fatini Toso, Fatini is a coordinator for the Design and Social Context Ethics Network at RMIT and has a PhD in literature. Her research interests include AI and ethics from multiple perspectives, including intersection between science fiction AI and AI in reality. So welcome to our speakers. Uh, over to you. Uh, we are looking forward to hearing you all speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, Alexis, Ingrid, Sydney. We really, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm David, I'll briefly introduce everyone today. Um, obviously, uh, you just heard about Falk Marsh, uh, uh, Fatini and myself, and of course, we'll have Paul um, to speak later as well. I do want to echo um, the earlier comments and acknowledgement of country. Uh, I won't add too much more to that, except this lovely um, image from uh, a book we bought my son when he was born. Uh, I particularly like this notion and that last sentence there about thanking elders, communities, traditional custodians for their courage, strength, integrity, and values. And 
With that, if I may, I might ask Falk to talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and large language models. Yep. Uh, thanks, David, and thanks to the event organizers for the invitation to speak today. So my name's Falk, and I'm a professor at RMIT. And my area is information access and retrieval systems, and I'm based in the School of Computing Technologies. So my research focuses on information tools, including things such as recommender systems and search engines, and in particular in understanding how people interact with them and how those systems can help or sometimes fail to help uh, effective information access. So this session is about AI ethics. And I, yep. Uh, thank you uh, for advancing the slide. Perfect. Um, and I thought it might be useful to just start with some definitions to set the scene. So at the highest level, um, there's a lot of talk um, all over the place, of course, about AI or artificial intelligence. So this is a branch of computer science that focuses on creating intelligent machines. And the aim is to get those intelligent machines to perform tasks that we would normally say require human intelligence. So that might include things like visual perception, speech recognition, decision making, and language translation. So these are all examples of complex activities that humans can carry out quite easily once we've learned to do them, but that have been exceptionally hard to codify using traditional computing approaches. So in typical programming, you give the computers detailed step-by-step -step instructions that it follows. And if you can't come up with those detailed step-by-step -step instructions, then it's hard to get the computer to do that thing. And, and AI is interested in that thing that you can't easily break down. Another term that's um, all over the place these days is machine learning. And um, often AI and ML are used interchangeably, but they're not quite the same thing. So machine learning is actually a subset of AI that specifically focuses on developing algorithms and statistical models so that computers can learn from data without them being explicitly programmed. So in other words, machine learning algorithms are one way to build AI systems, but there are also other approaches in the broader field of AI. Uh, then drilling down further, neural networks um, are a subset of machine learning. And this refers to a group of technologies that are inspired by the way in which neurons in our human brains work. And the foundations of neural AI were laid quite a while ago, back in the 40s and 50s, by scientists such as McCulloch and Pitts. And they first developed a model of an artificial neuron. And then slightly later in the 60s, um, Rosenblatt introduced um, a thing that he called a perceptron. And the algorithm that he designed for his perceptron was capable of learning to classify images and other data using a single layer of these new artificial neurons, again, inspired from the neurons in our brains. However, while there was some initial excitement, back then hardware was, of course, very limited. And so the approach quickly plateaued at an early stage of its development, and then interest in this space declined for a while. Now, it has come back twice since then. We're now in the second phase of, of its return, um, and this time they've come back big time. A fourth concept I just want to quickly introduce and that also gets raised in this space is language models. So this is another type of AI um, modeling that focuses specifically on predicting the likelihood of words or phrases in a particular language. So these models are designed to understand the context and meaning of natural language text, and to generate coherent and relevant responses to a user's input. So the way these language models work is that they're trained on large amounts of text, such as books or news articles, and then they use statistical methods to identify patterns and relationships. So this is a task that we humans are naturally pretty good at. So for example, if you see the string of words, a chain is only as strong as its weakest and then you're asked to predict what the next word would be. Uh, probably a lot of people would come up with link. And so you'd hope that a language model, after it's been trained on an appropriate corpus of text, would be able to also recommend that link is probably uh, a useful word to add in this context. But note that these language models are probabilistic in nature. So it's not saying that it will always be the word link. Other words would also fit there potentially, but they will. In a well-trained model, one would hope that they have lower probabilities than link. So the exciting thing that has happened recently is we've moved on to this large language models uh, paradigm. 
And these have come around through a range of developments. Firstly, um, we now have more sophisticated machine learning algorithms, and you'll hear about deep learning all over the place. Uh, but these are, in essence, neural networks. So they're building on those foundations from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, but just uh, putting them together in new and innovative ways. We have a huge increase in computing power. So also, we can build much larger um, networks of neurons now. And thirdly, and really importantly, we now have huge data sets. So this is largely thanks to the internet and the digitization of everything. So in the past, um, if you wanted to train any of these AI techniques, um, you'd have quite a limited range of things, right? You might have a few electronic versions of books or an archive of newspaper articles or something. But these days, we just have ridiculous quantities of stuff. And so ChatGPT is the currently hugely popular instantiation of these large language models. Um, it is large, literally. So it has 175 billion parameters. Um, and it has been trained on a huge amount of text. So 570 gigabytes of web pages, books, and other sources. There's another important aspect to these LLM, LLMs, though, and ChatGPT in particular, and that is that they also involve some human training. So the initial learning algorithm updates the, the representation that's stored in these neurons in these complex networks, but humans are required to help the algorithm. And in particular, there's several phases. So first, um, people generated example prompts. So these were the kinds of questions that the chat GPT system might be asked um, by users. Then other people generated possible answers to these prompts. So what is a good response? And then still another set of people were asked to generate preference judgments. So if there's a number of responses to a particular prompt, which one is the best one that the system should aim towards? So that's all good. That was to en enable the system to do its conversational interaction. But there's also another human step, and that is based on the notion that these systems should ideally not create negative output. So you may remember from a few years ago, Microsoft released an early chatbot uh, on Twitter, and it quickly learned from users, and it became quite nasty and started issuing racist and inflammatory statements, so it was taken down. So to avoid this, the creators of ChatGPT outsourced the problem again to a large number of humans, and they were asked to label examples of horrible text so that the system could then be trained to not uh, emit such output. Um, and that humanist focus, yeah, where we could segue to David's um, piece about authorship and that humanness too. Great segue. Sure. Is that, are you saying what time is up? <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's fine. So very quickly, these systems do um, raise a whole number of issues around data privacy. They generate things that are sometimes wrong. As we mentioned, there's this human training requirement, um, which is potentially distressing to the humans who have to identify the horrible things. And there's maybe a lack of safeguards in what these systems can and can't do. Um, but yes, skipping quickly on, let's skip the AI in STEM disciplines and over to you, David. Thanks so much, um, Falk, and thanks everyone for your time and interest. I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about recognizing AI tools in research outputs, broadly, creative research outputs um, specifically. So um, these next slides are actually illustrated by Midjourney, and I've included the prompts I use to co-create these images. Um, I've chosen Byzantine mosaics partly because of my amateur love of Eastern Roman and Byzantine history, but also with the hope that whatever art Mid Journey has hoovered from the internet uh, to create these images uh, was created by someone who's been dead for about five to 15 centuries, and so probably doesn't have an issue with the use of, use of their work. Although, uh, check out the chap on the left with his seven fingers on one hand. In recognizing contributions of AI tools to research, uh, I argue that existing principles of research integrity and the idea of contribution are uh, probably better guides than ideas like creativity and, and agency. Um, so there is, of course, a, a, a creative boundary 
um, that first question there about whether creativity is required for authorship and acknowledgement, but I'd suggest that's a little bit fuzzy. Um, and the question I'd like to answer today is, is about that fuzziness, is about how we, at least for now, best recognise and communicate the contribution of AI tools in a way that meets principles of research integrity like honesty and transparency and, and fairness and respect. There are useful ways of talking about authorship and acknowledgement that think about these things in terms of, of contribution, um, like those, those top two there, um, using criteria of contribution. I would suggest that AI seems capable of many of the um, intellectual and scholarly contributions uh, in, those, in those resources. So for instance, acquiring research data, um, analyzing research data, um, and with ChatGPT and GPT-3 uh, in mind, um, certainly drafting significant parts of a research output or, or critically revising it. That credit, that contributor role taxonomy also recognizes contributions like validation of data, data curation, visualization, I guess like these, these images I've used this afternoon, um, even project administration and all of these things, AI tools are more than capable of contributing to, uh, to creative practice and, and other research. Um, that third source there, Jenkins and Lynn, um, talk about synthetic scholarship, um, with which I have an issue on its own, but they also talk about the idea of continuity of contribution through various stages of research, like the conduct and eventual dissemination of, of research. There's a big difference between the contribution of tools like Microsoft Spellchecker and Grammarly um, and ChatGPT writing manuscripts. This is something we've been discussing um, at RMIT, but I would suggest, hopefully not too controversially, that it's one of scale rather than of kind. So Grammarly is editing work that's already been written by a human. Um, but that's still a contribution. It's a shallow contribution and not one that would be recognized or even declared in a, in a research methodology, for instance. But here we have mapped some common creative practice AI tools on a, on a proposed spectrum of contribution and recognition. Um, thinking about those questions from a couple of slides ago about whether AI can be an archive, a participant, a, a co-contributor. And as an example, my use of mid-journey this afternoon, I couldn't create these images on my own, as you can see my awful design skills from this, this spectrum here. Um, but nor could mid-journey make these particular images without my prompts. So I would suggest that in this regard, mid-journey and I are co-creators. Um, but the way in which I've used these images this afternoon um, means that this presentation would not be too diminished um, by, by their absence. I've also referenced my interaction with Midjourney on these slides and the style recommended by RMIT Library. Um, and Marsha made the excellent point uh, this morning in a conversation we had that just by doing this, just by referencing Midjourney, um, like personal email correspondence that gives the tool a certain, a certain agency that we may not have recognized in the past. So I'll wrap up on this slide and say that although there have been some really interesting, really cool journal articles that do recognize AI tools as co-authors and in the case of GPT-3 as a lead author, um, and although thinking about the contributions these tools can make to research is useful, there is a second criterion of authorship that AI fails, and that is the ability and willingness to be accountable for that contribution. And we did, when I say we, I mean Marsha again, we did ask GPT, chat GPT directly whether it was accountable uh, for, for what it writes. And you can see its response here. So although um, they can make interesting and useful contributions to research, um, AI tools can't be accountable for that contribution in the way that authors and researchers, creative practitioners and, and artists are for theirs. And in the absence of that, that accountability, we argue that AI cannot be considered an author of research um, as authorship is presently understood. And 
we're not alone on this. Um, the Committee on Publication Ethics um, and publishing houses like Nature have, have recently shared similar advice. So more useful than authorship um, would be to recognize those contributions of AI um, by human authors in things like methodology um, and human publishers to emphasize their use in in any declaration. And I'll wrap up here with a final observation. Um, this These images here were a little bit amusing and a little bit unsettling in that I asked Midjourney to respond to the prompt imposing AI and it returned some very imperial, some very religious, but some very human images. And with that, I might ask Marsha to talk to us about the trouble with AI. Thank you, David. Um, uh, yeah, I'll um, just continue on from that sort of idea of um, authorship and so forth and what is AI. In the creative practice space, um, how people can work with it. The idea of trouble, you know, I've sort of um, took shamelessly from Donna Haraway of sitting with the trouble, with the problem of something, um, in that, you know, I'm not necessarily seeking to find answers or applications, merely um, wanting to sort of unpack the problem, you know, the potential troubles to look at them and see where they might go in future. So, What's the trouble with AI? Um, we came up with a hypothetical scenario to think about the implications of AI for institutional ethics um, practices and procedures. So, and we've set up this hypothetical project where we've got a PhD candidate, you know, just for argument's sake, the PhD candidate is one of my students who's a creative writer use, who wants to write an interactive graphic novel designed for smartphones for their PhD. And they want to use an AI system. Their research question is how can AI text and image generating systems help creative writers push their practice into new forms? Okay, a bit of background on this hypothetical candidate. She's um, got experience as a fantasy writer, but she, um, you know, really doesn't like her own drawing skills. She's thought about working with someone else, but she wants to test her ideas first. So she thought um, she might use something like Mid Journey. The other student. Um, for argument's sake, one of Forks working in the area of AI, researching um, novel deep learning based language models to generate text for an inter interactive graphic novel. Their research questions are, how can AI learn to generate text and images with minimal to no human input? What is required to achieve this? The students wanted to, um, the students, you know, are working together. The creative writer is using the um, algorithms, um, the application created by the um, computer science student, and they're writing storylines. Um, as part of their PhD, they want to conduct some em empirical research. You know, this is particularly important for the computer scientist. So they want to be able to spot and see, um, I might add the writer too, that this thought experiment rec replicates work that's um, already been done with that um, fusion of art and science research coming together. But anyway, they want to see if readers can spot the storylines that are written solely by the AI, written with input for the AI, and stories written solely by the creative writer. Um, they decide they're going to crowdsource participants to judge the authorship situation. Um, they've also read that um, in one study, it was not until um, text, this was a poetry study, it was not until the text was put into a PDF um, visual format that um, the, they started to get more accurate results. So the text is um, generated as um, 
as um, JPEGs as images so that they're not easily searchable through Google. So they decide they want to crowdsource participants to judge the authorship situation. They present the participants with a series of storylines and ask them to indicate which of the authoring categories each storyline belongs to. Um, now, in terms of applying for ethics, they need to apply to do this survey. The ethics ap um, application process is really quite straightforward because as long as the researchers um, disclose fully to the participants that they'll be asked to judge storylines, um, some of which will be written by an AI, some by a human and some um, edited by the human, tweaked by the human. There's, um, in terms of permission, there's no um, deception going on. So it's a straightforward, low risk ethics application. From our point of view, you know, does the story end there? And at this point, I'll hand over to Fatini to pick up on um, the ethics framework within Australia. Thanks, Marsha. Uh, yes, so just to pick, picking up on that, uh, next slide, please, David. Um, that application from our hypothetical students was, as Marsha said, very straightforward. It was a survey, it was anonymous, it was crowdsourced, let's say through social media and LinkedIn. Um, and just on the screen here, I've just got the definition from the national statement uh, about what is human research. And that project we just described fits that category because the human participants are those that are crowdsourced to look at the text that's been produced and see which one is from the AI, from the creative writer, et cetera, and see if they can be picked out. But does it end there? Um, in the human application, are we, you know, they, they, it's a survey, it would be anonymous, it would be online, they could have thousands of responses uh, and, and create quite a good data source to then analyze and see um, the results and to see whether the the people could pick out the AI versus the the human writer, so to speak. Um, next slide, David. The national statement, though, does uh, outline these four values: research merit and integrity, justice, beneficence, respect for human beings. And at the moment, it only, obviously, uh, refers to human participants. The question is, though, does it end there? If our students, for example, did not crowdsource, if they didn't want to test their AI, they didn't want to test their graphic novel with human participants uh, to see who can spot the AI versus the human, would they need ethics? The short answer would be currently no, they would not. Uh, if they're just creating the graphic novel, the computer scientist is trying to push the, the the limits of that AI to see how much human input is required and the creative writer is using their own practice as, as their research. So they may not necessarily need uh, human research ethics approval to conduct that project. But there is a lot of concern at the moment that you know if AI is being used as a contributor, it could potentially be used as a participant um, and could provide data that potentially is misinformation or, or it could create things that then take on a life of their own. Uh, what do we need to do in terms of these four values within the national statement in the future? Do we need to potentially think about expanding these to include the beneficence, uh, justice, respect for human beings more broadly than just those participating in the research project? Just to counter on what AI is capable of um, especially in terms of uh, not necessarily writing text as those two students were doing, but in the, you know, chat GPT, for example, in that conversation that's going to be happening uh, where people are testing, the system is then learning from human participants. Does that have, does that have a place to consider uh, when we're thinking about ethics and human research ethics? For the moment, all the input is coming from human beings. Does that need to be acknowledged? Does that need to be uh, assessed in some way in, at an institutional level where you know, that participation, however indirectly, 
um, needs to be considered in, in terms of a human research ethics application. At the moment, of course, the national statement does not allow for that. Um, but is it something that needs to be done in the future? Next slide, David. I think that's it from me. So I'll hand back to David. That's all from us. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I might hand it to you or to Paul, but really, really appreciate um, everyone's time and attention. Thank you, everybody. Yes, do stick around. We'll, there'll be plenty of questions in the chat. And next I'll pass to Paul White, who's a PhD candidate, and he's looking at authorship of generative text and using data traces and narrative. So look forward to hearing from you, Paul. Thank you. Cool. I'll just um, share my screen. Okay, how's that looking? Yep, can we see the slides? No, try again. Mm, I share the wrong screen this time. Screen one, screen two, screen three, that's probably the one. How's that? No luck. Oh, wait, there we go. There's yeah. a bit of delay. Here we go. You can see it. Okay, can we see that now? Is he still? Oh, oh good. Not moving. I've got a slideshow. It's swap screens. <laughs> Is it full screen for you? No, but we can see this first slide. All right. I'll just go through from here. Um, what I'm looking at is, so I'm a um, PhD candidate. Um, I've been around for about six, my seventh year, I think. So when I started, my big issue looking at generative text was how can I get a system that is capable of putting together two coherent sentences um, back in 2016, which isn't so much the problem now. Technology's moved on. Um, so Marsha Berry, Marsha is one of my supervisors, and Patrick Kelly. Um, I started out nominally in uh, Dirk and also the nonfiction lab. So I've got to focus on my creative practices, uh, a nonfiction piece. Um, and I'm looking at Photoshop for text. So theory and methods for using generative text systems and real world data to produce creative nonfiction. Um, automated realism is kind of the idea of what I'm looking at. Um, so creating narratives from data, but not the way that it's commonly referred to um, when, you know, people uh, get a big pile of statistics and go, I want to make a story from this data that I've collected. I'm looking more about creating narratives from real world. So I'm kind of reverse engineering or trying to find how can I get uh, an example of a real world situation and then deconstructing it as data and then putting it, re writing a set of rules to reconstruct it later. Um, and this is an example of kind of reality fanfic, I think, um, where I'm very aware of it's a lossy process. So anytime, um, even, you know, a traditional work of nonfiction, you have to try to choose what you are going to tell the reader. So, you know, you know, you have access to historical data. Um, how much is relevant? How much do you put into the story to convey what it is you're trying to convey? Um, so kind of with the Photoshop for text, I'm looking at a program um, which doesn't exist, but is going to exist, I would say, in the next five years. You know, there's already systems out there, um, especially in screenwriting, where you can plug in story elements and the system will create uh, beats and a script for you, um, which I've seen, uh, there's a, oh, I can't recall the names, there's a couple that I've sort of been looking at that are very interesting. Um, but if you have sliders to create a story, you need to make it funnier, sadder, more controversial, you know. Um, all of these issues mean you have to define everything. So you need rules to say, what is funnier, what is sadder, um, what is more dramatic. So it's a very authorial practice and it's potentially very biased. So the biases around AI systems could be very useful for authors because if you want to have an authorial voice, every authorial voice is intrinsically biased by belonging to an individual. Um, so for once that bias could be used for good instead of generally evil. Um, so I'm a humanities, like I, I'm not a programmer. I don't have a, I've got a professional IT background, but I'm not a, um, I don't have a programmatic background. So 
in 2018, I went to the Association, uh, the International Conference for Computational Creativity in Salamanca, which was very interesting. Um, I had a lot of very interesting discussions with comp sci people um, around the ideas of computational creativity. And I think I was the only non comp sci, I was like a humanities person at a comp sci conference, which was, they were very interested. I was very interested. Um, but I was generally under the impression that I say that typewriters don't write poetry. And a couple of people asked me if I was at the right conference with that opinion, because these people um, at the conference, the, and it's inherent in computational creativity, that if a system is capable of producing a work that if produced by a human would be seen as creative, then the system is, is expressing creativity. Um, which is, I'm fine with that view, but as raised earlier, the idea of agency and responsibility comes into that. So if a system creates a work that is great and wins a prize, who gets the prize money? Um, or again, if the system creates a work that is very sexist, misogynist, racist, just you know, homophobic and terrible, um, do you just blame the system? Or is there some way you can actually, you know, um, someone says, actually, that was me. So as well as that, there's the idea I found interesting talking to a lot of the people at the conference that if they are writing a system that creates poetry, does that make them a poet? Um, or conversely, if you're using a non-poetic system to write poetry, I would say yes. You are, if you are setting out to write poetry, no matter what medium you're doing it in, you're, you're writing poetry. But I found it very interesting, the attitude of a lot of people around they're just building a piece of software. And again, you know, if you're using Photoshop, you don't credit the people who created Photoshop when you're, you know, in your finished image. But what I I thought was needed was an authorial model for generative text, and this is um, one of the main chapters in my research. So I've looked at how can authorial voice be split, I guess, or projected into um, the final piece. So I've come up with this idea of there's a system owner who is politically who owns the system, like Murdoch owns Murdoch Press and has an influence on the final output. Um, the designer um, is uh, has some authorial responsibility. The builders of the, the programmer has responsibility. The system itself um, has a different flavor. So ChatGPT is different to Bing, is different to um, Lambda or Galactica. They're all large language models, but they work and have a different flavor. Um, the corpus curator, the person who chooses the corpus for the system, has an authorship um, input. The corpus author, obviously, has an authorship input. Uh, the data labelers, which is a very, um, this has been mentioned uh, increasingly now, that the people who label this data for these massive language models, um, usually for, you know, way below minimum wage, potentially in refugee camps, doing all sorts of horrible work, um, labeling data is a, set, a definite type of authorship. So if you say these are happy words, then the system treats them as happy words or sad words, and that's authorial. Uh, the system user, the end user, is definitely an author. Um, and the reader, so just some reader response theory. Um, so the reader has an input in how they see the final work as well. And I go into a lot more detail, <laughs> which I won't do here. So as an analysis, um, looking at uh, work using this model. Um, and this is what David was talking about earlier, the spectrum of contribution. Um, I've just done it in a, an auth looking at it from an authorial standpoint, um, potentially. So Mexica is a wonderful work uh, by Rafael Perez Perez and Mike Sharples, um, looking, which generates uh, folk tales from, uh, the from the people who are originally living uh, where Mexico City is, Mexico people. Um, so the system owner here would be Raphael, the designer, uh, and Mike, because they've built it col uh, collaboratively. The system, Mexica, um, outputs a definite type of text you can recognise as being belonging to Mexica. Uh, the curator was Raphael and Mike. The author, um, they've used folk tales, but they, I guess, um, Raphael and Mike have sort of uh, formed the tales to fit into their system. They use the system themselves and the reader is public. 
So this work, I would say you could say, and there isn't a hundred percent of authorship that gets divvied up amongst these different levels. Um, as we can see with the next example, where I've also looked at ChatGPT for this. So the owner is Microsoft or OpenAI. I think Microsoft now that they've put a $10 billion stake into a company that's now worth $28 billion, I think. Um, the designer, these authors are just from one paper, which was pre-ChatGPT. Um, this came out you know, a couple of years ago, but there are many, many, many other papers and it's built on a vast amount of other research going back, as David was saying, like you know, decades. Uh, the builders, hundreds of open AI engineers, potentially. Um, the system is ChatGPT. The curator, open AI. Someone has politically chosen to take words out of the system or um, as, you know, some controversy arises, they'll change, they'll censor the um, words that can come through. The authors, um, it's been scraped from billions of pages of text written by millions of people. So it's a collective authorship. Uh, the system user is public. The author could actually also be public too, I suppose. And the reader is public. So it would be hard to project an individual's authorial voice, I would think, using chat GPT based on the amount of um, other input into the system. Um, so very quickly, let us look through some of my, my creative practice. What I'm doing is looking at... Um, the data that an individual would shed throughout a day. So I've got a giant spreadsheet and I've imagined uh, a number of characters. I'm focusing on one in particular, and I've just got a six minute increment um, throughout the day, everything I do in that six minutes. Um, Cause I used to have a data lawyer a long time ago who had to do this for timesheets. Um, and I've gone through and gone, what data traces did I leave in each of those six minute increments? That's the database that I'm working with. And I've, I have made all this up because ethically I don't want to go around stalking somebody. And a lot of this technology is essentially just stalking. So it's not magic. If, if, if I stalk somebody for every six minutes of the day, I'd probably know them pretty well. Um, the trick is then knowing what is an, an important event for a narrative. And I've just made up a formula of an event equals time, location, participant, plus action and sentiment. Um, and then there are levels of description. So it's kind of a thick description. So there's the machine level of description is the pure data. Then you've got a simple description would be um, a system template to turn that data into a simple line of text. And then you've got a complex description, which would be me writing the text as if I was there watching the character do it um, just to show the difference in how well, I guess it's that lossy compression idea what gets lost using the systems and just based purely on technology that is ex exists now I'm not trying to make up some you know in the future magical stuff will happen um, so that's yeah and that's I'm in the process of completing my creative practice Marsha I'm, I'm getting there really um, uh, and I'm hoping to be submitting later this year. So, Wonderful, Paul. Thank you for the insight into your research. Look forward to reading more about it when you do some publications about your findings. Mm -hmm. And we've got some great uh, commentary in the chat, a lot about um, authorship and recognition of uh, copyright, for example, in how people feel about their works being used by chat GPT to be create derivative work for others. Does any has anyone got thoughts about that, about the copyright implications or reuse of other people's creative works and, and the implications of that? I'm sure you do. So it's a matter of who would like to speak first. Hey, folk. Sure. Well, I guess, and as I think someone pointed out in the chat, this is currently being tested in some US courts. So I guess we'll all be enlightened soon, at, at least in terms of what one US state believes the, the case to be. But it just seems very complicated and unclear right now, is what, what I would suggest. Well, if I could add a little filter or a twist upon that. Um, you know, we're, we're living in the global south uh, in many ways compared to the uh, American court system. Um, we're more attuned to 
are Tarung Wai Wai, the places that we stand. So issues around cultural appropriation um, and the ways in which uh, open science, open access, open data uh, sort of erases the notion of indigeneity and um, I guess dismisses the nature of data colonization in an imperialist kind of structures that we've had to deal with over centuries, 15 to 20 uh, centuries, millennia, even before then. So I guess my question is, um, in the world that we live in, what are the issues around cultural appropriation that are being uh, discussed, challenged, um, or ignored in some of these bigger discussions that headline the usual chat GPT and other generative art, generative text discussions. So any one of you, cultural appropriation in this space, give it a go. Um, I was, Carl uh, uh, Baker, who's a great researcher um, in this field, he is, he's got an interest in the South Pacific um, in a lot of the way it's being navigated historically. And he was working with some people in Fiji and was asking ChatGPT around the names for the winds of the, from different directions. And it got one right and eight wrong. So he was just making them up. So unless you have a very deep knowledge of what those things are called, you know, it's it's a classic thing of um, ChatGPT is just going to make up stuff because it's just a very large autocomplete system. Um, but even with a better system, the training data then, you know, the permission, has the permission been given to scrape all this data? Um, it, I can see you'd be torn between wanting to be make sure that information is accurate, but without working with the stakeholders um, in a you know, respectful way, it's going to be very problematic. And I'll just point out Ingrid's comment in the chat about Tahika Media has had to deal head on with this issue of appropriation of cultural data. And yet they've got a very interesting approach of uh, how it's actually accelerated their research um, because it's offered a language model that they can then test upon their corpus and test to see what works or doesn't. So the affordances as well as the challenges are definitely up with the play. So I, I just add to that, as Paul, I think quite rightly pointed out, right? ChatGPT as a standalone tool has issues in that it can generate very authoritative sounding answers that may or may not be actually correct. However, we're already seeing uh, the next sort of iteration of this, like Microsoft adding ChatGPT to its Bing search engine. So now that goes off, does a web search, then generates an answer based on that and gives you citations. So some of these issues are likely going to be similar to those that have already been around with the search engines, right? Do they have rights to the data? They're now in some ways post-processing all of that data. Previously, they said, well, it's not. we're not doing anything with it. We're just indexing it and then giving you the access to it. So yeah, it's yep, lots of new issues arising in this space. So um, one thing which is quite relevant that I, I just saw in the last week, um, I just sort of put a link to in the chat. There's a, the Braggoscope, which is the Melvin Bragg. Um, he's got a radio show on BBC, has for 25 years, called In Our Time. And someone has uh, jury rigged a way that GPT can look at all the episode descriptions and has gone through and um, totally like on their own, nothing to do with the BBC, but it's catalogued over a thousand episodes with Dewey Decimal um numbering so everything is indexed all the you know it's probably the best example of the use of gpt that i've seen um anyone do so far because it's limiting the data to something that exists and not trying to make up and even his the person who's done it has said it still is a little bit fuzzy around the edges but i think when you can limit the um possibility of it making stuff up it's got its most potential, but if you just yeah let it go and do its own thing, then it's very very risky. And there is well, a question a reminder that we're sort of in this world of AI for lamb, and I'm sure Catherine is going here: libraries, archives, museums, and records. And some of the ways in which our colleagues are harnessing AI 
are simply the pragmatics of what can you do to render access better for your user communities. So that's a great example, Paul, thanks. But over to Catherine. Yes, and along those lines, Sydney, about uh, you know librarianship and archivists and their uh, their role as intermediaries in misinformation. Then there's a question in the chat about you know how, what is our role to be uh, looking to regulate or make sure that um, there's there's the there's some ethical use of AI and other frameworks that we can establish. I know you know to date librarians and the AI for Lamb community look to have a kind of be the beacon of, of against misinformation. What can we do uh, to set frameworks to ensure that, you know, we're, we're using this technology ethically or that things are built ethically? Do we know of anything underway already? And maybe there isn't. Maybe there's work that we're unaware of. Uh, I've just shared in the chat a uh, framework that um, Fatini uh, brought to our book chapter around um, so the Department of Innovation. So it's a framework for artificial intelligence ethics. Not quite that legal principle that I think um, Emma had in mind, but probably a good starting point. But I would hazard that issues of misinformation are a bit broader than than AI and the solutions might be the same or there may be a technical solution that Fog might be able to speak to, but embodying the principles of responsible research and the stuff that we do, including um, with AI is our first step. But then of course the reader, the addressee needs to have the, the critical thinking skills to try and pick through that stuff as well. And that's much tougher, I think. I heard about somebody that was checking their, you know, that their work their visual art wasn't too similar or breaching copyright of someone else. So asking the AI, is this too similar to other works? But there may be some ethical uh, problems with that in that you're asking the system that created it in the first place. And anecdotally, we've heard of research leaders who will ask ChatGPT to look at a research proposal and make suggestions for what could be improved. and. Chat GPT did have some helpful suggestions. So um, that's a, a different use, um, but a, an interesting example of what Paul was talking about, that potentially positive one. And we certainly had a message in the chat where it is often used as a prompt. Whether the intervention is successful or not, it can be a, pro a prompt for a divergent path you may not have thought about. But I wonder if we could lay on the table a little more and perhaps in the time remaining, think about this notion of trust, uh, which is you know, very complex, quite problematic. And in New Zealand, for example, it's the basis upon which our Department of Internal Affairs, which administers our National Library of New Zealand and Archives New Zealand. And, and it becomes a concept that uh, suggests in an ideal world, uh, a kind of commensurability between an organization and its panoply of users. But trust is a pretty loaded term. So in your experience uh, panel, I'm just wondering, you know, have you been able to give some shape, some form, some teeth to this notion of trust and what does it entail in your research experience? Personally, I have become more cynical, um, possibly because a lot of my research is looking at um, ad tech. So a lot of the existing tools that are around were developed for advertising, for tracking people online in order to segment and put us in a little, make a little homunculi version of us that gets put into a giant data set and sold to advertisers. So that has kind of poisoned, in a way, a lot of the tools that are available because their original purpose was purely for that um and that's what that's the tools that are available so when google you know whoever meta make their tools available to researchers the tools are sort of co-op we're trying to co-opt and direct it in a new direction in the first place um so it's just made me even more cynical than i already was <laughs> but i also as i said earlier i think the potential for create like if people say oh what's what's chat chip good for well marketing marketing copy and games it's going to be incredible for anything that doesn't have, you know, games, um, anything that doesn't have a, 
a bad outcome, I suppose, but you still need to that that monitoring to, to try to, you know, uh, the TAY debacle when that happened with Microsoft, they just didn't have a blacklist of words. So they didn't, they hadn't even tried. Um, I think because it, it had been running on in China for 40,000 interactions on, a, and the Chinese internet is very different to American Reddit. So they just assumed it would be okay because culturally it had been in a very different space. Speaking for myself and my role, trust is research integrity, trust and responsible research are, are vital. And of course, researchers and institutions are held to a higher standard than other um, sources of information. Um, but the things that are promised by AI tools are exciting and worrying, as is the case with a lot of other research. And, you know, although there are ways of searching for text and comparing um, similarity and detecting plagiarism. There's still plenty of plagiarism among researchers. So um, I'm encouraged, not yet terrified. Is that appropriate to say? And that's actually, unless there are any other comments from the speakers, that's a, a lovely way to close out the session. Um, being optimistic, somewhat terrified, but going forward and yeah, looking to those, um, the, the, there's a thing in the chat from um, Ingrid about the algorithm charters and things that we can do to as a community to really leverage this technology in an ethical way. So thank you for all your insights today to the panel. Thank you for all of the organisers and everybody attending today. Thank you very much. We'll see you at the next AI for Lamb event.